following up on um, Ben uh, Siavini, um, where I'd like to introduce um, Carrie Facer. Um, Carrie's not a, an, an artist or a designer, but uh, she's a, a social scientist, uh, I suppose. She's the professor of education and director of the CREATE Research Group. Um, she specializes in digital cultures, emergent uh, technologies, as well as institutional change. And I think maybe that's going to be the, the key interesting uh, uh, point of her, uh, uh, of her talk. Um, she works at the Education and Social Research Institute, the MMU, and she was also, up until recently, um, the research director um, at the Future Lab um, here in the UK. And her talk is uh, entitled, uh, Learning to Live in Uncertain Times. So, Kerry, welcome to uh, Manchester and to Future Everything, and the floor is yours. Thank you very oh, much. and you've got your the own The time is very clock. uncertain. I've had to bring my yes. clock with me. I suddenly realized that I didn't have any sort of a watch. Um, right, so, Learning to Live in un Interesting Times. What I'd like to do is, is take the title of this conference quite seriously. We use the word future a lot, but what, what do we actually mean? How do we give it some sort of materiality? How do we have a sense that the future is a space and a place that we are building and that it's a place and a space that therefore has consequences? So to, if you like, stretch a little bit of our future's brains, minds, I just want to start with a question. How old will you be in 2031? It's quite a painful question to be asking ourselves. Well, it depends how old you are, I guess, but you know. So how old will you be in 2031? What will the world be like? Can we imagine the Future Everything Conference in 2031? Will it be happening? Will there be conferences? What will we be doing? Who will be there? What will this space be like? Which bits of it will still be here and which bits of it will have gone? What are you basing your assumptions on? I've been doing futures work for the um, UK government for the last three years, and what's absolutely fascinating is to realise how much our thinking about the future is simply based on unexamined assumptions. So before I start today, I really want to talk a little bit about how the future gets made, and I want to think about some of the other factors that we might want to build into our thinking, apart from just the dreams and the aspirations that we might have. So there's a huge field of study, the sociology of the future, dating back at least to the, to the 60s, if not the 50s. Um, and what we see is that there's, if you like, three kind of main components to the production of the future. This seems to be where we're working often in this conference. It's a very exciting space to be working. We're looking at the pull of the future. We're looking at the visions. We're looking at the possibilities. We are also a little bit looking at the push toward the future. We're looking at some of the emerging trends, clearly things like open data and so forth. But what I want to focus on a little bit as well is, is saying that unless we also take into account things like the weight of history, all of our future visions, all of our aspirations may in fact come to nothing. So I want us to think about the weight of history, the drags, the counter movements, and I want us to think about what we're up against. I want us to think about some of the emerging trends that we're seeing outside of technology and also other technological trends from those that we're working with now and think about which of these cause real disruptions to some of the future visions that we've been working with during the uh, conference so far. But most importantly, I want to ask this question, who gets to shape our visions of the future? Okay. So, having watched too many of the leaders' debates recently, this uh, little, little line is an indication of the levels of optimism that I am going to have about the future as we go through today's talk. So just to flag up that there is a plummeting bit, but don't worry, it will get better. Um, so I want to really start by saying we make our own future, but not in conditions of our own choosing. Everybody sees why that's a paraphrase on. So I want to talk about the conditions we're working in, I want to think about the importance of designing the future as though everybody mattered. And I will finish with some projects. I will be talking about some fountains and some lions towards the end. OK, so what's this based on? This, base is, this is based on six years as research director of Future Lab, which is a multidisciplinary, cross-sectoral um, R&D lab, bringing together creative digital artists, educators, policy makers, uh, young people, teachers, um, and the technology industry. 
And it's also based on a programme that I've run 2007 to 2009 for the government called Beyond Current Horizons. And this programme was set up to look to 2025 and beyond, thinking about socio-technical change and thinking about its implications for education. Um, all of the information about that programme is available on the uh, Beyond Current Horizons website here. So that programme brought together reviewers from every field from neuroscience to gerontology to childhood studies to economics um, to try to really start to get a grip on what the pushes toward the future, the weight of history and the pulls towards the future that um, are kind of bubbling up at the present time. Okay, so that's the background. So let's think about the push of the present. What are the big trends that are going on? I'll start with technology, given where we are. Well, everybody here is familiar with ubiquitous computing and pervasive media. I'm not going to be talking about that. We are already clearly working on data and the question of managing the information explosion. Although one of the things that has not been addressed, as far as I'm concerned, is what's the difference between knowledge and lived experience and data? At the moment, we're simply talking about things we can capture and quantify. I think there's other sorts of knowledges out there that it might be harder to digitize. But we may also need to be thinking about nano and biotech. And when we start looking at this field, what interests me about it is, is, is not the arguments about the new materials, but simply the change in our conception of space that working at this scale brings to us. So for me, the parallel is actually with things like the, um, the, the, the early pioneering explorations across the globe that we were getting at the, uh, at the beginning of the last century. It's like the discovery suddenly that you can work on a whole new terrain. You have the capacity to engineer, to build, to reflect, to change um, in a whole new set of spaces. So when we're thinking about things like the future of the city, how do we visualize the fact that the city maps and the city spaces that we tend to be talking about are envisaged, if you like, from a human scale or from top down? How do, we, how do we find a new form of representation that allows us to integrate the nano, the molecular, the biological with, if you like, the physical streetscape? The second big issue that I want to flag is around large-scale complex systems of systems, and I particularly want to, to raise this after Ben's last talk, because one of the things that we tend to do in the technology field is we do things and we say, oh, ubiquitous computing, it'll be lovely, everything will be interconnected, it'll all work fine, there's, the, there's no problem. Let's just have a think about the complexity of these systems that we're working with. Computers are now multiple, yeah, that should have an E, um, computers. I mean, we, you know, even a PlayStation 3 is made up of, if you like, eight computers. At the same time, the institutions are networking tens of hundreds of computers locally and globally. All these systems are linked together. The important issue here is that many of them were not designed to be linked together in any shape or form. We're in a world of bodging, cobbling together, fixing, and trying to do our best to get these things to talk to each other. And many of these systems have human components, which, as we know, are far from perfect. At the same time, into these large-scale systems of systems, we're starting to introduce the concept of emergence. We're starting to use biological metaphors to say to these systems, you can self-organize yourselves, you can self-manage yourselves, you can self-repair yourselves. This might not be a fantastic idea. My colleague Dave Cliff, um, who's Professor of Computer Science at Bristol, is running um, the UK's largest uh, program on large-scale systems of systems. This is his take on it. Put bluntly, the complexity of large-scale complex IT systems and of the socio-technical systems of systems that they combine to create is going up very fast indeed. At the same time, our socio-economic dependency on these systems is also rapidly increasing. The problem is that our ability to understand and manage these systems while it's going up, it may just not be going up fast enough. We face the worrying prospect that sometime soon, society finds itself critically dependent on interacting and interlocking large-scale systems of systems that no one really understands and that are capable of failing in ways that no one predicts until those failures actually occur. This is a guy who's designing it. This is, the, this is one of the guys who's at the cutting edge of how you make large-scale systems of systems work. And he is very concerned that we do not have the social and cognitive uh, and intellectual support to enable us to figure out how to work with these. So when we're thinking our future ubiquitous pervasive world, we also need to be thinking, how do these systems fit together? 
The third socio-technical trend that I want to talk about is around this issue of backlash. Because we tend to assume that future trends sort of go like this and they sort of continue nicely. What we do know is that things have reversals. This is an image of the, um, the genetic makeup of the 1918 flu, um, which, uh, which was posted on the internet and led to a profound debate about whether we should be making this sort of information widely available and calls to restrict information for the sake of human survival. There are already, as we know, concerns around the potential for new technologies to bring surveillance um, and control. This is an image of uh, a guy on the first day of the Heathrow terminal f uh, opening when the large-scale system systems that were yeah, baggage handling and airplane systems profoundly um, collapsed. And anybody in the UK who sees a picture of a guy on a train with a laptop knows that we are seeing massive resistance and concern about the idea of giving data to government bodies because we're not convinced they're going to be able to manage them properly. So one of the things, when we're thinking about futures, is not just to think about the ones we're making, but also to be aware of the fact that these futures that we're producing can hit barriers, they can hit reversals. Okay, so we're on the downward slope on optimism. I promise it comes back up because we're going to start with environmental trends. Um, so... Let's just flag, we are in the situation where um, we are probably in a post-oils, peak oil situation um, already. This is the optimistic projection that there is a gentle decline and we'll be able to backfill that gentle decline with alternative energy sources. Um, there are two or three other graphs that present alternative futures. One of them has a series of rapid and fairly catastrophic steps in terms of access to energy. And the other one simply presents a cliff. There is profound uncertainty about the degree to which we will have access to energy. Um, these images show um, some of the challenges that we will be facing around access to resources. Um, the top left picture is an image of the amount of... Um, of uh, rare metals that are currently available. And one of the things that's worth bearing in mind is something like 95%, 97% of the rare metals that we use are available from China and they've been restricting access to them since 2004. So one of the questions for those of us who are making material artifacts and material technologies is we need to be thinking about new materials, but more than that, we're going to be thinking about having to embed recycling. We're going to have to take seriously the cradle-to-cradle -cradle argument. The second two pictures are the ones, and actually Ben in the last talk raised these, are around the other resources that we simply take for granted. The first is a map of um, access to improved water sources. And this bottom one is simply showing um, the land grab that is going on internationally as countries are going, uh, as rich countries are effectively buying up land in poorer countries in order to grow biofuels and in order to get access to their minerals. So some of the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of this future that we're going to be in in 2031, thinking about this environment, where are we getting access to food? Where are we getting access to water? Where are we getting access to the minerals and energy supply? And the third point really I want to raise about the environmental trends is that the two degree temperature rise that we're concerned about is in fact already built in. The two degree temperature rise is the product of industrialization. And what happens with the two degree temperature rise are these outputs. We get increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather conditions. We get complex effects on global food supply. We get conflict over national, natural resources. Significant increases potentially in refugees. Now, we can know all of this. The question is, how do we adapt? How do we respond? How do we change? I mean, there are those, for example, who saw the Manhattan Project and decided that was the end of the world. We'll all give up and go and live in mud huts. There were others who said, right, we'll see this and we've got to figure out how to change the world and adapt to ensure that that doesn't happen. So when we look at this sort of thing, we have an interesting choice. Particularly, there is a, there is a report that's on the desk in government departments in Whitehall that says the UK doesn't need to worry about environmental change too much because basically we're going to be okay, is the line. So the question is, is how do we respond? In 2031, when we're sitting here or not, will we be sitting in a lifeboat state where we have decided to welcome people from southern Spain, southern Italy, from the Mediterranean basin? Will we have said, come in, live in our cities, we'll find other ways of making this work? 
Or will we have decided that we're a city and a state that has put its walls up and has invested in defense and has invested in trying to keep itself? And we all sort of face this question on an individual basis. I remember when I started doing futures work, after a while you start thinking, maybe I should stop doing this work and I should just go and buy a hill or maybe a boat and you know, start building a wall. Um, and the response is, actually, you can only go down that route if you're prepared to defend it. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we prepared to defend ourselves if that's the attitude to the rest of the world that we want to have around climate change? And I have to say, that, that's not my strategy. OK. Now, there's a lot of people talking about technological trends and, and, and environmental trends, but I want to talk about the demographic shifts. Um, and I want to talk about the ageing population. Now, how many of us are going to be over 50 by 2031? Yes. OK, this is us. <laughs> this is our world. When you look at some of the forecasts, we're looking at 50% of the Western population aged over 50 by 2035. 25% aged over 75. And these are not people who are going to die next week. These are people with a long life expectancy. This is a very different structural model of society that we may be moving into. And these older people are not going to be going, oh, I'm 55, it's brilliant, I'm going to retire, I'm going to have a lovely time, there's no worries. They're probably going to need to be working longer, they're going to need to care for people, and they're going to need to keep learning throughout their lives. And that's going to give very interesting, um, that, that also is a product of some very interesting family structures. We're looking at increasing beanpole families. So instead of sort of short, fat families that have a couple of generations and loads of kids, we're looking potentially at multiple, um, multiple generations in one family. One of the forecasts is that there will be over a million people aged over 100 in the UK by 2035. So um, who are we designing for? has to be one of the questions, and I'll come to that shortly. But, I mean, there's also an interesting issue here around 50% of our life is spent being a grandparent. What does that mean? What role will we be playing? How do we design for these people? So the demographics are a trend. There is clearly the world of the, of the singularity. There is clearly the Ray Kurzweil world, um, the capacity when we think sort of 50 or 100 years ahead, the idea that we will download human intelligence into machines. I have to say, I think it's highly unlikely, mainly because I think there will be massive resistance to it. The concept of the human, I think, is very, very strong. But what's more interesting is the argument that if we get to 2025, 2030, and we're able to surf the waves of medical development, that we will be able to live for an extremely long time. And as an educator, I get faced with the question, well, what does lifelong learning look like if you can live 400 years? Do we need children in that sort of model? OK, so changing adult-child relations, though. This, I think, is one of the big developments that we haven't quite figured out how to get to grips with yet. And adult-child relationships and intergenerational relationships structure so much in society. This picture on the left here is of a, a child that was sent through the penny post in America um, when they first developed this, this communications technology. They thought, it's brilliant. We can get the kids from one place to another. They stuck stamps on them, and they posted them across the country. Um, after they'd done it a couple of times, they decided it probably wasn't a good plan. But the principle there is that the model of adult-child relationships we've been living with for the last 100 or so years is one in which adults are seen as the knowledgeable people, the people who have power, the people who have control, the ones who've learned enough to be able to act in and on the world, whereas children are seen as vulnerable, changeable. Um, they're seen as things that you can do whatever you like with. When we look at what's happened over the last 20 years, we've seen a big disturbance in this image of adult-child relations. First, we've seen kids figure out how to use the most powerful symbolic tools of our society. So we we're seeing children able to use uh, computer games, the internet, a whole range of other technologies in a way that adults are struggling to keep up with. And at the same time, we've seen adults have to figure out how to learn themselves and how to keep learning. The notion of adulthood as a time of stability is completely blown out of the water. And so one of the things that we're struggling with at the moment is this question of, well, what does it mean to be an adult? What does it mean to relate to young people? What is it that we can actually have confidence in when we're teaching? The other issue when we look at those changing demographics is that our society is based on reciprocal relationships of care between the old and the young, the young and the old. What we're already starting to see 
is the potential for conflict between generations. There are centres set up, the Centre for Intergenerational Justice, for example, um, who are beginning to say it's simply not fair that the baby boom generation should have been able to take all the material wealth and all the resources and go into a happy retirement while taking the money resources that we need ourselves for education or for, or for uh, university. We're starting to see the baby boomer generation being presented as the cause of climate change. And so some of the forecasts that we look at may see um, a vision of 2031 as a space not of intergenerational solidarity, but of intergenerational conflict. And what happens when a society turns in on itself within families? Not cheery. Okay. So those are some of the trends. Those are some of the pushes that are going on at the moment. What I want to also talk about now is if you like, the big weight of history. And some of the sessions have talked about this a little throughout the conference. And the biggest weight of history that I think we're needing to take into account when we're designing our futures is simply the fact that the world is not flat. It is complete nonsense, the flat world argument. Figures 1998, 225 of the world's richest people have a combined wealth of $1 trillion. That's equal to the combined annual income of the world's 2.5 billion poorest people. My favorite stats recently, in 2007, 25 hedge fund managers managed to take home uh, 14 billion pounds between them. So there is income inequality, but that inequality is also intersected with gender inequality. 70% of the world's poor are women. And what we're starting to see is also that age intersects with this. 13.5 million people in the UK are income poor, and 13% of these are pensioners. That figure is likely to go up unless we start trying to figure out how to deal with the demographic shifts we're looking at. Now, technology intersects with these inequalities. In the UK, 10 million people have never used the internet. The world that we're living in, in this conference, and the world that I, you know, we all spend a lot of time in, and we love it, and we enjoy it, and it's challenging, it's exciting, it's a tiny part of the much wider world that has significant amounts of inequality. And what we're starting to see now is that unemployment and surplus um, is, 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 being, is being built in structurally into a whole range of countries, to the point that we're starting to see models that expect our society to be working confidently with a surplus population. Now, I don't know how many of you have, have come across Charles Murray's accounts of uh, what he calls the underclass, but this is a very different vision for the future. So Charles Murray, an American, calls himself sociologist, um, advocates some very problematic things in relation to how you deal with, um, with those people who are currently considered surplus to need. But this is some of the future that he's uh, talking about and suggesting that uh, may be emerging over the next 15 years in the UK. 15 or 20 years ago, he says, the homeless panhandlers and street hustlers were everywhere. Today, they're virtually gone in most cities. Graffiti used to be everywhere in American cities. Today, it's rare in the better part of town. The social segregation of the underclass has been nearly perfected. Hence my prediction that in 15 years, perhaps less, the underclass, or NEETS, um, will no longer be a political issue in Britain, and urban life for most of you will be much more present than it is now. The price will have been a great deal of money spent on prisons and, in effect, the writing off of a portion of the population as unfit for civil society. In the United States, I've called this the coming of custodial democracy, literally custodial for criminals, figuratively custodial for the neighborhoods we seal away from the rest of us. Custodial democracy is probably headed your way. So one of the interesting questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're imagining our cities and when we're imagining our new technologies, frankly, is who is it for? Because if we don't ask those questions, Given these historical and structural inequalities, it's likely that the environmental, demographic, and technological trends that I've already talked about will reproduce, reinforce, and amplify these existing inequalities. So yesterday, for example, I was at a session where a guy was talking about the network city. And was saying that the city is a fantastic place because you live one place and you can just move over there and there's a bit of Ikea there and there's a bit of something else over there. So the city is not a physical space. Last year, I've been working with uh, young people in Withenshaw who have never been into the centre of the city in Manchester. Those of you who know the city will know that that's, what, a 20, 30-minute bus ride. 
Um, when I was in Bristol, we had um, a girl who was working with us, um, and we wanted her to go up to London to take uh, a document for, for a bid. She'd never been out of uh, the southwest of England. She was 21 years old. The notion of the mobile citizen, the notion that everything that we are talking, that, that the things that we take for granted in this conference are extended to everybody is profoundly mistaken. So my argument really, when we look at these trends and when we look at these inequalities, is if we don't want a future of custodial democracy, and if we don't want a future where the technological developments that we're working on serve to produce this a little bit more, is that we need to develop new visions of the future that are more inclusive. And the only way in which we can do this, I think, is by designing the future as though everyone matters and diversifying who gets to be involved in designing futures. And this is a particularly important thing for the UK at the present time when I think 75% of the current cabinet were in Oxbridge. Um, there are four women. There are as many people called um, David in the current cabinet as there are women. Um, so how do we diversify who gets to be involved in designing futures and why should we do it? Well, the first thing is, is as I said, if we think the future being made up of the pull of the future, the push and the weight of history, okay, these two are happening. So our domain of action is in reshaping the pull of the future. And if we can get a wider range of people involved in thinking about how we redesign, how we develop our futures, we will have a different and more diverse and more engaged and more meaningful and fairer future. If you're not bothered about that, then that's fine. But I think many of us are. Why else might we want to diversify who gets to design the future? Well, you know, it wouldn't be a futures conference unless we quoted Bruce Sterling. Um, so Bruce Sterling says, when the unknown unknown comes lurching into town, you have to learn about that comprehensively and at great speed. Generating new knowledge is very good, but in a world with superb archives, accessing knowledge that you didn't know you possessed is both faster and more reliable than discovering it. Now, I've talked about a load of trends, but trends are just trends. They can be stopped. We do not know what the future will bring. If we do not know what the future will bring, we do not know what knowledge is important. If we do not know what the future will bring, we do not know whose expertise, whose knowledge, whose identity, whose values are going to be important. And therefore, it's really stupid of us to write off big chunks of the population as irrelevant because they haven't quite caught up with the creative cultural city as envisioned by Richard Florida. We cannot afford to overlook the much more diverse knowledge base um, that we already have. Third reason, why should we diversify who gets to design the future? Well, having spent the last, well, quite a few years um, working with young people and children in design projects, my feeling is, is that once you work with different groups, you get different and you get better ideas. Some of the biggest breakthroughs in um, technology have been related to designing for accessibility in working in constrained creative environments. Um, and these are, these are a couple of the, of the projects that I, that I promised you. But I want to flag this one. Top left here is by a colleague of Drew's at Lancaster, and it's called Free All the Monsters. And the design challenge they set for themselves was, how do we design a game that allows um, families and kids to be playing um, ARGs in the city street? Because you've got an entirely different set of design constraints when you've got five-year-olds playing things. Because, you know, it's just not a good idea if they're walking around looking at something because they'd probably get run over. Um, that has led to the most delightful and beautiful game. Um, and it has the best solution for how you integrate GPS signal into a game I've seen for a long time. They basically talk about, they basically basically make the GPS um, signal cytoplasm. And if it's really full, you've got a high GPS signal, you can then attack your monster. It's fantastic. It's delightful. Um, this is um, a program, uh, a, a resource that we created when we said, well, how could we let very young children um, moderate, change, and shift their environment? And this is a project called Fountaineers. Um, which is a programmable water fountain. And the fountain has sensors in it. And the children um, can program those sensors to respond in different ways to different things that are going on. So if everybody's running around the playground going completely hyper, then they can program it to sort of play bubbling, soothing um, water spouts. Or if everybody's incredibly 
laid back and chilled, they can make it go higher. It's actually much more complex than that. If you go on, on the website, um, yes, it's called the Fountaineers Project. You'll be able to find it. And this is the next one uh, that I'm going to show. It's a project that um, we did a long time ago now. And you'll tell how long ago it is because the GPS packs are in the kids' backpacks as they're walking around. Um, and it was a project that we did where we were trying to say, how do we find a way to help kids not simply learn about something, but get a real experience of, of something? So what we did was, um, it's, a, it's about how do we get kids to have a sense of what it means to be in and part of um, an ecosystem. So this is the Savannah project, which will start in a second, I think. The Virtual Savannah is a groundbreaking project involving Nesta Future Lab, the BBC Natural History Unit, Hewlett Packard and the University of Bristol, and the MRL, University of Nottingham. It uses the very latest advances in mobile phone technology to help children learn about the natural world in a new and exciting interactive way. Computers in the classroom overlay an imaginary African savannah upon the school playing field. The location of each player is monitored by global positioning and text, sounds and images are picked up by the children. The players out on the savannah have to hunt and survive. They get to understand what living as a real lion might be like. The pioneering work done by the Virtual Savannah Project will show how these immersive experiences may one day become part of children's everyday learning. My favourite part of that project was I, was I was listening on headphones while the kids were going round and we had two or three of them mic'd up. And uh, the children would get a, a picture. So if they walked into a certain area, they'd find themselves in the Maasai village, for example. Now, occasionally, because it was very early, the GPS system kind of went a bit wobbly. The games engine hung. And um, so you'd get stuck with an image. So this one little boy goes running in, gets into the Maasai village, suddenly realizes, and it stays on his single, on his, uh, on his device. He's running across the field. He's saying, the Messiah's after me. The Messiah's after me. <laughs> yes, dear. Um, anyway, right. So that project um, is, is one that couldn't have come about in the way it did without the question of how do we design for this particular age group. So I'm going to close by talking about my sense of how do we equip our cities to learn, adapt, and cope to the significant changes that may be coming and to the significant uncertainty um, that we may be facing? And my sense is that if we really want to create cities that do not take for granted that there should be a surplus of the dispossessed, that we need to think about creating a learning city. And by a learning city, I don't mean what was talked about yesterday, which is the the colonization of the city by the university and the school. I think that's a very bad idea. Schools and universities are good at teaching some things, but actually, they've also made us believe we can't learn ourselves. They've made us think that there's only one way of doing it. And they've also made us think that the only purpose of learning is to get qualifications. So I don't mean that. I mean a learning city where we design the future as though everyone mattered, which means a city where we find ways to value a whole diverse set of knowledges. And I'm talking about knowledge here. I'm not just talking about data. I'm not just talking about gathering sensor information about people as they walk around. I'm talking about how do we learn the lessons from the guy who managed to make it here from Somalia and his experiences? How do we learn the lessons from my great-grandfather who's sitting in the allotment and really knows how to grow potatoes? How do we learn the lessons of the woman who's been the postman for 15 years and is able to tell us how to cope with conflict uh, between 50-year-old you know, women who are trying to get the last loaf of bread. So how do we create a city where diverse knowledge is valued? How do we create a city where not only is that valued, but where people are enabled to share that knowledge with each other? And how do we enable that sharing to help us learn how to live better as a city? So <clears throat> some steps that are already happening. The museums field is starting to do some really interesting work on taking seriously the idea of knowledge um, coming from the community. Fantastic project called Every Object Tells a Story being run by Kate Parle in Sheffield. 
Robert Jaynes, I think, is probably the best writer on this, writing in Canada about really radically rethinking the museum sector, particularly in the face of environmental challenges, is his concern. We also then have um, organizations uh, like the Education Justice Collective in the States that is bringing together researchers, educators, young people, community leaders to really identify the sorts of knowledge that makes a difference in a local area, and that's not the same as qualifications. We're starting to see new educational forms emerge. Finally, those of us who've been reading Ivan Illich and Paulo Freire for years, we're delighted to have the technology finally to allow us to put that into practice. So we have things like the School of Everything. The School of Everything is an online space where I can say, well, I want to learn something, and it matches me with a tutor who knows how to teach it. You don't need to go to university now or to schools to access educators. Clearly, we've had the rise of co-design and participatory design movements for a long time, but I think we're finally starting to figure out what the relationship is between experts and participants. And one of the other things that might help in creating a learning city is the issue that there are limits to growth. And if there are limits to educational growth, then we may have to start spending a lot more time trying to contribute to our lives rather than spending our, many, our, our lives trying to um, earn a living. And the New Economics Foundation, I think, is probably doing some of the best work in that area. So I want to finish with the design challenges. And there, there are, of course, a whole range of projects that are already contributing to this. But my sense is if we wanted to create a learning city that engages everybody, these are the things that we need to figure out how to do. We need to figure out how to map and visualize systems that, um, that make it easy to navigate, represent, and share embodied knowledge. Not just data about me and how I've lived, but embodied knowledge about my experiences and what I can add to the world. We need documenting systems. We need to get better at being able to record everything that we're doing so that we can find it again. We need to find ways of connecting these knowledges together. And most importantly, how do we build the physical anchors within the city that allow us to connect it with, if you like, the virtual layer? I mean, I'm, all, I'm very excited about Ben's ideas about the cloud as a representation of the city. My question is, is, how does the lived and embodied and physical experience of living in the city connect with that cloud space? So those are the challenges that um, I'm working on now and over the next few years, and I'd be very interested in hearing anybody else's ideas around that. So um, this is what we should do. Recognize where we're starting from, recognize the value of all human experience, build collaborative learning cities, and my, my final point really is a strategy of surplus and dispossessed populations will not help us to survive the 21st century, and I think we need to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carrie, are there questions, comments, or feedback for Carrie from the audience? Oh, it's all right. deep, deep in the future. Um, well, one, one of the things that I was uh, thinking of that came up in a number of points in, in, uh, in the talk is the, the work with the children that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, are you also um, having the kids um, tell you what kind of technologies they're interested in? Or is it you give them technologies and, and they use it? I mean, the vis-a-vis -vis relationship between the yeah. kids and the technology. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there's, there's all sorts of different ways of doing it. I mean, um, Alison Druin at Maryland has probably got the best description of the different ways in which you can do it. But, um, you know, so you can either work from ethnography. So we've done a huge amount on games, um, studying how children's games playing practices might allow us to reconfigure educational practices. Um, or at other times, I think it's really important to put stuff in kids' hands because we have spent some time um, talking with young people about their futures. And um, it can be a little bit depressing sometimes because they can simply just want more of the same or amplifying their existing practices. So you have to do quite a lot of work with them to support them to imagine that the world might be different uh, and that they might use technologies in different ways. So, yeah. 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 I mean, especially in the sense that, I mean, the world is changing so yeah. fast. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how that's adapted to the to the, let's say, the shorter uh, history of, of, of children and how they see that uh, developing. I'm really interested in old people. Anybody here doing <laughs> any work with old people? The best time I had in my life was about 13 years ago and I was studying informal learning and I was at a tea dance to try to understand why people 
what they got out of it. And as I was being swung around the floor by an eight-year-old, he would say to me, I danced through the war, I danced through the Thatcher years, I don't know how you younger generation survive without dancing. I think there's wonderful things you can get out of working and learning with much more diverse groups of people. I love working with my friends, I love working with the colleagues that we have in this community, but you get so much more out of really trying to engage with groups of people who have different challenges. Um, I just want to say one thing. I worked recently with a, a charity called The Railway Children, um, which is a, a charity that focuses on those kids who've become completely detached from their families and from social services. Um, and the story there was of um, one girl who had become so isolated from the rest of society that she thought she was safest um, living under a railway bridge with a group of men who were pimping her out every night. And that was where she felt safest. Now, this girl, um, we can't support her because if she wants to go back, because as soon as anybody has to encounter her, they have to try to get her to go back to school. This is because legally she's supposed to be in school at the age of 13. So one of the questions that I've been interested in recently is how could we, what tools, what resources, what technologies could we develop that would help support those kids that have become detached and that who we can't engage with officially because the strategies and policies that we have in place are so insane. So what might we come up with as a creative community that could mean we could come up with alternatives for a 13-year-old girl whose only sense of safety is currently being pimped out and living under the railway bridge. Sorry, cheery, but there you go. Well, maybe just on a, on a, on a cheerier question, or maybe not, um, in the work that you're doing, um, which is the age at which people consider themselves to be old? Oh, they all consider themselves to be old. You have a brilliant time. You have a great conversation with eight-year-olds, and they say, oh, don't let the six-year-olds do that. They don't know how to do it. Any age, it's two, it's two three years younger. Yeah, they're all, they're all inadequate. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's lovely when you, you start working with, really, with older people, though, because then they start actively promoting the value of being young, um, you know, and they enjoy, they enjoy that identity.